Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be able to present my stuff in front of you. I'm um, looking forward to hear what you think. Um, Merced has treated me well so far. I'm actually representing you right here. <laughs> um, and um, people say it's boring here, but you know, um, as an academic, this university and this department is, is really inspiring on an intellectual level, so I really appreciate being here. Um, so, this MTS series runs under the header of dynamicity, and I'm going to talk about dynamicity in terms of low-level phonetic processes today that might give rise to actually consistent structural um, properties of the linguistic system. Um, a little bit of background might be appropriate here. Um, so, I have a heavy background on experimental linguistics. However, my PhD project, and that's part of um, the stuff I'm working on during my PhD here, is actually a descriptive theoretical work. Um, I'm actually describing a subpart of um, a phonological system of a language that is typologically interesting, and therefore it has implications for phonological um, theory and other aspects of linguistics. So today, I'm not going to talk about quantitative data a lot. I'm going to talk about qualitative aspects of um, the segmental and intonation system of the language I'm working on. All right, let's get started. Um, communicative functions such as you know, the distinction between a statement and a question can be signaled by a language via many ways. It can be done by Morphology, so you basically add an element or an affix to the text to signal the contrast, as it's done here in this English example. It can be done by word order, so you actually change the order of elements to signal the contrast. Or, most importantly, it can be done by um, intonation. Um, as it's done in many languages for ex uh, to, to express, for example, the contrast between a counter expectation or echo question and a plain statement, as it's done here. So we have, you love food, and you have, you love food. Um, intonation, in its narrow sense, the way I use it here, is the modulation of fundamental frequency to signal post-lexical meaning, such as sentence modality. So in this example, you have the tonal movement on the final word here, so the tonal peak and the subsequent fall that, that marks the, the declarative status of the statement. And in the, in the case of the question, you have the tonal rise at the end that marks the echo question. Such tonal movements are realized by modulating the frequency of the vocal fold vibration. And if you haven't, uh, haven't ever seen a glottis doing what uh, it's doing during um, speech production, I brought you some uh, uh, gift here. Oh, wait. It is super slow, -mo yeah, and it's gross if you've never seen it. <laughs> so it's vocal folds that you know that uh, converge at a particular point in the glottis, and then they vibrate if the air pressure is sufficient enough. So to realize total movement, the vo movements, the vocal folds have to um, vibrate. When they do that, they they create a quasi periodic signal, and uh, it excites particular frequencies. And the lowest frequency of that signal is perceived by us as pitch. We call it fundamental frequency or F0. That's pitch. So to realize tonal movements, it is um, physically, uh, so vocal cord vibration is physically necessary to realize tonal movements. In other words, the segments, the tonal movement is superimposed on, uh, they have to be voiced in order to realize that tonal movement. That is not a trivial requirement. So in languages such as English and German, words usually have contain a vowel. A vowel is a highly voiced segment. It is uh, periodic enough to actually carry tonal movement and you know, um, fundamental frequency modulation. But there are languages out there that, are, uh, that have utterances without even a vowel or without even any voiced segment. And the language I'm working on is such a language. One of the extreme ex uh, examples is this one. That's natural speech, right? That's, I didn't make that up. I didn't play around with my acoustic programs. Um, so it can hear that in this language, the realization of tonal movements is inherently perturbed by the lack of vowels and voice segments. However, it is an intonation language. That is, it uses the uh, modulation of fundamental frequency to express post-lexical meaning, such as um, the distinction between a statement and a question. And today I'm going to talk about uh, possible conflict resolution. So a little um, outline of what I'm going to talk about today. 
First, I'm going to talk about the tune. The tune refers here to intonation and in its narrow sense, the modulation of fundamental frequency to realize uh, post-lexical means. The tune is superimposed on text, on segmental material, and the tune can be realized on voiced segmental material. After that introduction, I will take you to a trip, um, on a trip to Morocco, where I did my field work and where I collected my data. Um, we talk about Shi Berber, Berber dialect spoken in South Morocco. And I will give you a brief introduction into the segmental um, structures of this language as well as the intonation system. It will turn out that in Shahid, functionally relevant tonal movements sometimes cannot be realized due to the lack of voiced material. Right? And, I, and I would argue that the functional pressure to realize tonal movements in this language will lead to vowel emergence, which in turn, sorry, which in turn will be will enable the system to realize at least parts of the contour. Right, so that is my little outline. Let's talk about the tune and text in general. That has, that here is an example, a German example, and it is a legit answer to the question, are they still in Berlin? Sie sind in Berlin gewesen. Sie sind in Berlin gewesen. So what you see here, um, the black dots represent the uh, fundamental frequency, what we perceive as pitch, and this is superimposed on a waveform in the background. Um, what is remarkable here is that the speaker produces a tonal peak on the final, final word and a subsequent fall of fundamental frequency which marks the declarative status of the sentence. So if we look at the same sentence in terms of its segmental makeup, um, therefore in its proposition, but with a different tonal contour like this one. Sie sind in Berlin gewesen. Sie sind in Berlin gewesen. In this case you have a final rise of the tone and this expresses a counter-expectation or echo question. So the speaker is unsure with regard to the truth of the proposition. And what that just simply demonstrates is that the, the use of the dynamic modulation of fundamental frequency to express post-lexical meaning. And these contours here are rather pretty. And they are rather pretty because the segments chosen are voiced. But remember, you know, languages do not consist of voiced words all the time. But that is mainly because um, vocal fold vibration, this phonetic property, is exploited by phonological systems to create lexical contrast. So, for example, consider the minimal pair to sip and to zip, which is distinguished formally just by the vocal fold vibration of the first consonant. And it, it, it gives rise to a lexical contrast. So, sometimes intonation runs into trouble. That is the case when a tonally, uh, functionally relevant tone is realized or located on a word that has voiceless elements, and that is um, exemplified here. So, in the literature, there are two mechanisms, there have been two mechanisms identified that um, how an intonation system accommodates to such a situation. So, the first one has been coined compression, which has been found for English rising tones. And here you see the rising tone on three different words. A word with a bisyllabic word, a monosyllabic word with a long vowel, and a monosyllabic word with a, a short vowel. And you see, usually, the tonal movement is, is stretched over two syllables. You have that little fall here and then the rise in the second syllable. If you squeeze that move, um, movement on a short vowel and the final word, the movement, um, the, the, the range of the movements, the fall and the rise, are less pronounced undershot. So that is compression. The second mechanism that has been identified is truncation and shown for German falling accents, for example. So if we compare again um, uh, the bisyllabic word to the monosyllabic word with a short vowel, in the short vowel version, the significant point of this contour, the significant aspect of this contour, the low tone, is not present anymore. So truncation refers to the fact that the tonal contour is cut off. Right? That is a different mechanism to accommodate to such a situation. Bottom line here is that the text can drive the tune. So if there, are, there is lack of voiced material, the tune reacts in two different ways. It either is compressed or it is truncated, it is cut. All right, and in the present talk, I'm going to argue that the interaction of tune and text is not just that simple. The tune can also drive the text. The tune can affect the segmental material. In, in order to be realized. And to make that point, we need to um, look at a particular language, and that language is Tushalit Berber. 
Berber is an Afrozetic language spoken in north and white parts of, uh, of North Africa, and Shalit, the language I'm um, currently working on, is one of three major dialects spoken in, south Morocco, uh, in Morocco, and this particular dialect is spoken in South Morocco. It is spoken by an estimated eight to nine million people, so it's, it's far away from being endangered. Most data I'm talking about today is, has been collected on field trip in Agadir last year. Um, at the University of Agadir, in collaboration with the Département des Études Amazir. And that was a lovely experience because the staff, the dean, as well as all the students were super supportive and helpful and um, uh, gave me a warm welcome. It was really an amazing, um, amazing trip. And I did that with both of my um, supervisors, uh, Martin Grice and Rashid Ridwan, um, which helped me with the data collection as well as the data interpretation. Um, and Rashid would actually hate these pictures because he said camels are not representative for the life in Agadir and he's right and I don't want to imply that however I found it hilarious that I have two pictures, likeable pictures of my supervisors interacting with a camel <laughs> so pretty awesome, pretty awesome supervisor stuff um, and now I will give you actually an insight into how this language sounds like so the first one that used to be my plaque, that used to be my attention magnet on conference. So that was the first thing I showed to people. Right? So let's listen. So this utterance does not have any phonological vowel. It sounds pretty unique. However, there's lots of voicing going on and you actually can get a grasp of some kind of prosodic structure, uh, structuring and rhythmics as well as some melody going on there. So the next one, and I showed you that earlier, that's my new favorite sound file. I made uh, Rashid actually record this one recently. So let's listen to it. The sentence is, to be honest, is a bit constructed syntactically, but it just shows you how far Tashid can push it with regard to you know, insane from the tactics. And now I will give you an actual um, insight into you know, what, what, what Tashid sounds like in an actual dialogue. So um, here we have two female speakers performing a task-oriented dialogue. And what they did is they did a so-called map task. So this speaker has a map with a root on it, and there are particular landmarks on this map. The second one has, the other speaker has a map um, that is similar without the root, but uh, and with, with some of the landmarks matching to this one, however, there are some landmarks like the cat down here that are uh, mismatching in terms of identity or location. So the maps mismatch and they don't know that they're going to mismatch. The first one, the speaker having the root, has to instruct the second one how to get from the start to the end. Right? And this creates, because of the mismatch, that, that creates a particular communicative situation in which there's like questioning and answering going on, which is really um, informative for for looking at particular intonation concepts. So let's listen how that sounds like. Then it's the other one. And this is the other one. It's 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 the other all right, so a couple of things are remarkable here. First thing, the language has vowels and it uses it. Right? So the language isn't that off. But it, it might has, uh, have become obvious that there is a complex consonant system and that there are complex consonant clusters going on here. The second thing which is remarkable is the extensive use of prosody. So um, you can hear that prosodic structuring going on, lengthening of particular units, and um, the extensive use of intonational contours here, of tonal movements. Um, before we actually come now to the intonation system, which is of interest here, we have to understand particular aspects of the segmental um, system of Qi. So I'm going to do that now. Um, I don't want to scare you away with this phoneme inventory. Two things that are remarkable. It has just three lexical vowels and it has a complex consonant system. And that is because of two reasons. The first reason is that consonant length is distinctive in this language. And the other is the extensive use of secondary articulation features like pharyngealization and labialization. So it's quite a complex consonant inventory. However, that is not the most interesting about the, the segmental 
um, structure of this language. Um, Shahid is notorious for its syllable structure. So while in languages such as German and English, a syllable usually contains a vowel, in Tashahid, the syllable can be um, made up of consonants only. That is not super exciting yet, but when you look at the bottom here, syllables can actually uh, be made up of voiceless fricatives or voiceless stops only. And that is typologically not unique, but it's definitely very, very rare. There might be two or three languages reported that have this kind of pattern. And that obviously makes it really interesting for intonation research because the question arises, how can uh, functionally relevant tonal movements be realized on the text if the text is not, like physically not, able to actually bear the tonal movement. Those constant clusters, however, sometimes surface with vowel-like elements. I shall refer to them as vocoids or voice transitional vocoids, without committing to any analysis. Here. Um, they have a schwa-like quality, so this is the symbol for schwa. What is schwa? Schwa is um, basically the most neutral vowel, which is produced with a, the most central vowel, which is produced with a neutral um, vocal tract configuration. Okay, what is the status of the schwa? So, the, this question is, op is basically the object of the most heated debate surrounding this language. So many people only know the language based on this debate. So one camp of linguists say, schwa is a phonological vowel that is inserted to repair illicit structures. Illicit structures are structures that are dispreferred by languages such as vowelless syllables. Uh, at the other camp, um, mainly phoneticians say, well, this schwa does not have any functional role in the phonological system. It is merely an artifact of the dynamics of speech articulation. And I will now give you two, two arguments for this account. Um, the first one is actually a phonological argument coming from musical tradition. So versification in musical tradition is, is um, dependent on two types of syllables, light syllables and heavy syllables. Light syllables are syllables with two phonological elements like uh, C, and heavy syllables are syllables with uh, three phonological elements like uh, Rit down here. Um, and if you compare li lines in a particular versification uh, meter, um, you can see which syllables correspond to which syllable. So this line is made up of three light syllables and a heavy syllable. So proponents of the account that schwa is actually a phonological unit that is inserted would assume that this syllable here is actually a syllable with a schwa, a phonological element inserted. However, this syllable doesn't does pattern with light syllables, so it is basically made of two phonological units. It does not pattern with heavy, with heavy syllables. So versification is blind to schwa. Versification does not see this element with regard to the algorithm that decides whether it's a light or heavy syllable. The second argument, uh, that has to be highlighted, right? The second argument is the distribution, and it's a phonetic argument. So the distribution of these schwas is highly dependent on the articulatory environment. And to make that point, we have to look at articulation in an abstract way here. So, I will go through this graph in detail. So first of all, we have the phonemic sequence here. That word is produced right? Um, well, from a non-native speaker, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, we have four levels here that correspond to four, uh, um, four different articulators. We have the lips, we have the tongue tip, we have the tongue body, and we have the glottis. So a segment is characterized by an oral constriction and an accompanied glottal gesture. So the glottis can either be opened, so the vocal folds are not closing against each other, therefore you do not get voicing, voicelessness, or the vocal folds can be closed against each other, you get vibrating vocal folds, you get voicing. That is what this zigzag line here stands for. A constriction gesture in the mouth is conceptualized as a, a, a movement towards a maximum constriction in the mouth and a release of this maximum constriction away from um, the constriction point. So those plateaus stand for the maximum constriction of the active artic articulator in the mouth. We are not interested in the plateaus, we are interested in the, in the regions between plateaus. So we are interested in the time frame from the release of one constriction gesture till the next constriction gesture achieves, achieves his, uh, his goal, its goal. So in this time period, there is 
an oral configuration in which air can flow unhindered through the mouth. There is no constriction in the mouth. And this particular time frame can be accompanied by voicelessness or voice. So let's conceptualize it differently. So here is uh, alveolar stop, so the tongue tip closes off the alveolar ridge. And here is a velar stop, the tongue body closing off the velar area of back of the mouth. What happens in tissue heat between those two segments when they're um, following each other? Well, you release the closure, the constriction at the alveolar ridge, you retract the tongue, and then you achieve the target of the next constriction. So, in between, you have an oral configuration in which the air can flow unhindered through the mouth, there's no obstruction, and the glottis, is, uh, the, the vocal folds are vibrating. So you have an open transition and voicing. And this, this results acoustically in a vowel-like element, right? This particular schwa element here. So, in order for schwa to be realized, to surface, you need an open transition between co uh, consonant constrictions, <coughs> and you need a company voice, right? This particular model makes two predictions, two negative predictions. It, uh, it basically predicts that in a word like that, in a word in which you do not have an open transition between constrictions, you do not find schwa. So this case would sound like <coughs> and what happens there is the tongue tip stays at the alveolar ridge. There's no open transition, therefore you wouldn't get a schwa. Right? So no schwa in this case. The second negative prediction is in a word like that, I try to not do it with schwa, it's pretty hard. Um, you have open transitions between gestures, however, the glottis is in a state in which there is no voicing. So the glottis is spread, the vocal folds do not close against each other, you don't get voice. In this case, you wouldn't expect schwa. Um, and that is uh, what has been found by uh, Rashid Redouard and Cecile Fogerol. So they show that schwa is highly dependent on the articulatory environment. So they concluded, right, based on that word, it is just an artifact of the dynamics of speech articulation. That is the state of the art at the moment. However, I will argue today that that is not the full story, and to, to actually get the full story of this particular element, we need to look at elements, uh, need to look at phonological subsystems um, that, have, uh, that, that no one has looked at yet, and that is intonation and higher prosodic structures. That's what we do now. We talk about intonation in this language. And quick question. Yeah, sure. So do you see core articulation uh, constraints that change the occurrence of schwa? For example. Um, you mean when, for example, like depending on what you're going to say next, if you need more space or more room, you could inject something that will make the transition easier. Ah, you mean uh, like in, in English when you say tulip, you've got the anticipatory lip rounding of ooh before you say to, mm -hmm. right? Do you see sort of things like that? Well, the the particular environment is is definitely as has been argued here is determining. The, the place of, of uh, the, the surfacing schwa, whether it's there or not, the presence or absence, but, um, and it's definitely also the case that you find more schwa in a, in a situation in which you have, for example, a constriction in the front of the mouth followed by constriction at the back of the mouth because there's more space between them, um, rather than in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation in which you have two constrictions that are close within the oral tract area, so the transition is short, so you definitely find um, low-level articulatory uh, constraints on that. Um, and also, speaking of co-articulation, the quality of the schwa is highly dependent on the consonants that it's co-occurring with. So, for example, if there's a, a rounded consonants involved, the, 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 the schwa-like quality might be a little bit more like a rounded central vowel. Okay. Um, right, so intonation. Um, here are two examples of uh, one and the same sentence in, term of, in terms of its segmental material. So the same proposition, however, different intonation quantities. So it's, it's obvious that those two sentences sound entirely different. In this case, the question is actually an echo, uh, an echo question. You have a final rise in, in fundamental frequency and a subsequent fall. In the contrastive statement here, you have a little f, uh, f0 bump at the final syllable of iminun and the subsequent form. So what I want to show you here is that 
the speakers actually use fundamental frequency modulation to express post lexical meaning. That is just a trivial demonstration that it's actually an intonation level. All right. Another um, relevant thing is that um, the location of tonal events in this language seems to be very constrained. You usually find them at the right edge of phrases. Here's an example of a statement. And the question. Is he naming noon? Is he naming noon? These tonal events are usually realized on sonorant material, like, for example, vowels and sonorant consonants, like nasals or liquids. However, the location of these tonal events is highly variable. So here's an example of one speaker producing one and the same sentence within the same reading task, just at different time points within the task. And he produces this question which is characterized by a rise and a fall in fundamental frequency. We've seen that a couple of times now. He produces it with different contours. So in one case, he produces the final rise and fall on the final, uh, final syllable, and in the other case, he produces the rise and fall on the pre-final syllable. Um, this does not have any effect on the semant semantic or pragmatic interpretation of the sentence. Right? So it could be argued that it's free alternation of tonal location. However, it's not entirely free because there are probabilistic trends towards uh, probabilistic trends that reflect particular preferences. So tonal events prefer to be at the rightmost position of the sentence. So in this case, on the final syllable, you find them more often on the rightmost syllable, and you find them more often on very sonorous elements, so vowels are prefer, preferred to be tone-bearing units rather than, for example, sonorant consonants. So there is a rightmost preference and a preference for sonorous elements. On top of that, the co-occurrence of a tonal event with the segmental makeup has actually an effect. So if you compare dm with co-occurring with the tonal event and compare to dm uh, without the tonal event co-occurring with it, you see that this one is longer than this one, and if you look at the waveform, which is a bit light here, but you might see that the amplitude is way higher in the case in which the tonal event is, is produced on it. So um, what the tonal event does, it is phonetically enhancing the unit it is co-occurring uh, co with. Right? Those three points are going to be relevant at the end of the talk um, for my argumentation, so we have to keep that in mind. So. We talked about tonal placement on words with vowels and sonorant consonants. That's very well, that's good. But now we want to look at the really exciting stuff. We want to look at the fun stuff. So let's figure out what's happening when a functionally relevant tonal event is located on a word that has no voicing whatsoever. So here's the corresponding voiced contours. Again, the question. Is he naming them? Is he naming them? So there are three strategies. Um, of speakers how to uh, solve the conflict. One is, well, when you want to call it solving the conflict, you drop the tube, right? So in this case, there is no um, residual of the tonal event here in terms of fundamental frequency. Is it not? Is it not? They basically drop the tonal event. They do not did not realize it. The second um, strategy is you anticipate the tube. So you produce the rise and the fall on the preceding element. And that sounds as follows. Is in that Is in that And the third option that is the most interesting here for this particular talk is they can produce parts of the tune on schwa, what we've argued is a transitional vocal week, right? So a significant portion of this tonal event is realized on a schwa. Is in that Is in that the choice between those three um, strategies is highly speaker dependent. Do you find it? Um, so you find some trends that some speakers actually prefer and go along with one of those strategies. However, you find the speaker doing all three within you know a minute of, of eliciting uh, particular sentences. Um, so it's highly speaker specific. Interestingly, as on a side note, similar strategies have been found in musical tradition. So in musical tradition, in, uh, in, in versification, in shahid, particular musical notes are aligned with syllables. So here, looking at the F and the G uh, uh, musical note, they are aligned with syllables containing a vowel. So 
F is realized on Ta, and the musical note G is realized on Ri. What happens when a syllable is not able to bear a musical note? Well, in those cases, there are three options. The first one is you drop the musical note. The second one is you anticipate the musical note, so you produce F and G on the fifth syllable, right? We anticipate it. And the third option is you produce a musical note on a non phonological element, transitional vocal, schwa. So here we have three musical notes, E, D, and C, and we have two syllables. Usually, E and D would be realized on the vowel of Ri, and the musical note C would be realized on the vowel of Na. So what happens if we don't have any vowels? Well, usually, that's what has been reported, you find adjacent schwas that carry those musical notes. So in this case, it has been reported that E and D would be realized on the schwa of the syllable. And it's actually reported that the articulation of the schwa is maintained as long as it takes to realize those musical, musical notes. So we find pretty similar um, observations in singing uh, that we've found in, in, in actual language and in, in intonation. Um, I found that that's an interesting side note and some of you guys are working on musical cognition so I thought I'd uh, brought it in and we can talk about it later. Um, okay, another side note before we go back to the actual main story is um, what is happening when there's really no tune, when there's no tonal event realized? So what we did, I haven't done that quantitatively yet, and it has, has some pragmatic reasons, however, um, let's look at it impressionistically. Um, when you look at the articulation of the word which is supposed to carry the pitch movement, in one case, the red case, there is no tonal movement, in the blue case, there is a tonal movement, however, it's anticipated, therefore it is not realized, uh, or it's not associated to the actual word. If you look at those two um, words, and here I just picked, all, uh, picked out one fricative of this word, and listen to it. So this one, the red one again, is the one in which there's no tonal information in the utterance. And this one is the one where we have a tone, where, where we have tonal information, however it's anticipated. You, well, it is cherry picking here, however, you might hear a difference, and the difference is that the fricative pitch, the, fricative, the spectral information of this fricative, it, sound, it makes the impression of being higher. It's kind of a segmental pitch there, right? And that is actually what is acoustically going on. So here is a spectrum. On the x-axis you have frequency, and on the y-axis you have um, amplitude. And what that actually gives you, it gives you an indication of what frequencies are excited the most. Right? And both contours, the red and the blue one, are quite similar in terms of its form. However, the red one is slightly shifted to the right. Conceptually, that means the, this fricative here excites higher frequencies on average than the blue one. Yeah? And that gives the impression of, of a higher frication. And that is in line with work that has been done by Oliver Niebo, and also I've done some experiments on it. Um, in German, there is a similar phenomenon when you have truncation, when you have a, a tonal event that is realized on a word with voiceless segments, you find spectral information in those voice segments that correspond to the intended contour. Right? And that is very much in line with um, Bodo's account of speech, um, which I really like. Um, Bodo has put forward the idea that speech is a robust system um, uh, which is robust to internal and external perturbation by distributing uh, acoustic cues over the signal, right? So if um, a particular um, cue is not available due to perturbation, in another um, point of time, another cue might kick in or might be available for the listener to, to use to identify the actual function. And it's the same thing here. So there is an internal perturbation based on the phonotactics of the language. The tone can't be realized. However, the signal is robust. So particular um, aspects or particular cues to the function are distributed. And one of those distributed cues might be the spectral information within the fricatives. Uh, that's just uh, one of the sidelines. So let's get, we'll go back to the, to the main story. The main story is the tune realized on schwa. Um, so, remember, I told you that um, the former account um, to, to Schwab 
being a phonetic artifact, predicts that you wouldn't find schwa in this environment because you do not have voicing, therefore you don't get a voice transition of Oakley, right? That was the prediction. Well, we did a reading task um, with, with different uh, utterances in terms of syntactic structure and um, sentence modality, and we inserted entirely voiceless words into those sentences. And just by counting the instances of schwa, that is the right one, we find 44% uh, um, uh, instances of schwa in entirely voiceless words. So based on N, we have over 500 counterexamples to the just proposed account that schwa is just a phonetic artifact. So we need to reconsider this particular element and its status. So I give you some, uh, a little bit more information about schwa. So here you have fully, um, fully voiced contours. And on the right hand side, you have the corresponding version with it, uh, with a voiceless word containing a schwa. So let's compare the statement. Inna imi nun, inna imi nun, inna stift, inna stift. And now the question. Is he naimi nun? Is he naimi nun? Is he not stift? Is he not stift? Okay, something remarkable here is that those contours do not sound very different when we compare the voiced one to the voiceless one. That is because a significant aspect, a significant part of the contour is realized on the transitional vocal read. So it bears functionally relevant movement, uh, tonal movements here. Um, the next thing that is interesting is the asymmetry with regard to phrase position. So if we look at, at the target words that are in phrase final position, so the target word is the last word in the sentence, um, like it's the case in the just shown examples. <laughs> No schwa. In the Versacht. In the Versacht. A schwa. Um, we find that the predominant pattern, 62% of the cases, is having a schwa in this environment. If we compare that, however, to cases in which the, the voiceless word is inserted um, within the phrase in which a word is actually following, um, so this version is without a schwa. In and this one is with a schwa. Tiny little schwa there. Um, you find that the predominant pattern is not to have a schwa. So in 67% of the cases, you do not find schwa in this environment. So there's a strong asymmetry with regard to the target word um, and the phrase page. And we will get to that in a bit. So coming back to this dichotomy, you know, we need to re-evaluate it because schwa can't be just an artifact that is dependent on an articulatory environment in the way that, uh, that the argumentation was built, right? So it can't be. And it's also not entirely invisible to phonology. It's not entirely um, irrelevant because it bears functionally relevant movement here. So we need to reconsider that. And I don't think this dichotomy is helping us here. So. I rather look at possible states a system can be in with regard to the presence or absence of a vowel-like element and its role within the phonological system. So you can have zero, so you have a consonant cluster and there's no vowel-like element in there whatsoever. You can have a transitional vocal that is an element that has acoustic properties of a vowel. However, it does not belong to the system, it's not relevant for the phonological system whatsoever. It does not have any functional role in the system. And the third state would be phonological vowel, either a lexical vowel or an inserted vowel that is bearing some functional load. People usually think those pheno phenomena that they observe can be bent into those categories. Um, however, we know that language is not a state of system. We know that phonological patterns do not warp from one state to the other and language as a, as, as a social, uh, cultural, and cognitive phenomenon is dynamic and continuous in nature, and no one else knows that better than you guys. Um, so you would expect phenomena in between those stable states. And it's important to identify the mechanisms which actually change one stable state to the other. And I will propose two today. The first one, oh well, okay. <laughs> that, that's more than two. Um, Basically, uh, what this is uh, depicting is the fact that there are many evolutionary pathways from those stable states to the other um, in, in all kinds of direction. And I, just, I will just pick out one potential pathway from zero to a transitional vocal here. 
And everything I say with regard to this pathway is based on the ideas of Louis Goldstein, who is uh, currently at the USC and is affiliated to Hoskins Lab. Um, he is one of the founders of articulatory phonology framework, a rather uh, popular framework nowadays in phonology. So all credits go to him. And if it doesn't work, we will blame him. <laughs> um, so let's see what he what he uh, um, what he came up with. Actually, that is based on his idea he just recently um, presented in Manchester this year in May. Um, so it is based on the idea, an older idea, that there are prosodically triggered spatiotemporal effects. So it has been observed that elements at the end of phrases are longer than when they would be in the phrase medial position. So you have some kind of a lengthening effect at the end of phrases. This phenomenon has been called final lengthening and has been shown for many, many languages. This phenomenon has been conceptualized as a clock slowing mechanism that is associated to local gestures, articulatory gestures. So you have a clock slowing mechanism that affects the, the articulatory gestures. And it does so by slowing down the gestures, and that results in longer, larger, and most importantly, um, gestures that are far apart from each other. So it creates underlap. By doing so, you know, you get a more underlap, therefore more open transitions, or more space to realize, um, to, for sure, to surface, because there's more time, the, the vocal track is in, neutral, uh, in a neutral state, and, and, and um, vocal fault vibration is going on. So that model would explain what we get more schwa's in phrase final position and less so in phrase medial position. However, it does not explain why we have so many schwa's in entirely voiceless environments, right? So let's figure out why that is. I conceptualize the voicelessness of this word by one glottal opening gesture. So the glottis opens, stays open, and it closes at the end, right? And this is most likely not the case. And I'll tell you why. And now, actually, the most shaky part of my um, talk begins. <laughs> because um, I'm currently reading a lot on that, and I'm still not 100% convinced. Um, but I'm happy to talk about that. So if you have any suggestions or uh, a reading, then I I'm happy to, to take it. So <laughs> based on work in Germanic languages, Rashid did a glotto, uh, um, electroglotto, um, um, a photoelectroglottography with the Shahid speakers. That technique allows you to transilluminate the glottis during, um, during articulation. So you can measure the amount of light passing through the glottis while you're, while, while you're speaking, and therefore you can actually, as a function of the amount of light passing through it, um, you have kind of the openness of the glottis in an indirect way. Right? So you can measure the openness of the glottis with that. On the x-axis you have time, on the y-axis you have the the amount of light passing through the glottis in arbitrary numbers. So, the glottis can be in two states. The gross thing, again. Um, it can be open, so the vocal folds do not close against each other, you do not get voicing, uh, and you get loads of light coming, passing through it. Or you can, uh, the glottis can be closed, vocal folds uh, are closing against each other, and you get voicing. So, these two peaks here correspond to maximal degree of openness of of the glottis. And you see here, it's not a unimodal distribution, it is a bimodal distribution, right? So you have two peaks of maximal, uh, of the maximal degree of openness of the glottis. So you can conceptualize this pattern as two glottal opening gestures that are highly overlapping with each other. So basically voicing would be down here, however, because the glottal opening gestures are heavily overlapping, you do not get voice. If we buy that, if we buy that, then we can conceptualize the voicelessness of this word as two overlapping glottal opening gestures, right? One, two. And now our prosodically triggered spatial temporal effect jumps onto the final syllable, right? It is coordinated with the local gestures. It will result in a reorganization of the gestures such that you get larger, longer, and far apart gestures. You create more underlap. And that not only affects the oral gestures, it would affect the glottal gesture as well, right? And if you have enough underlap of those two gestures, if you pull them far, um, uh, apart far enough, then you 
get the glottis in a natural state during an open transition. Right? You imagine an open transition, there is no obstruction in the mouth. The air can flow unhindered through the mouth. Um, then you have like classic Bernoulli effect. You create a, a local underinflation at the glottis. The glottis, uh, the vocal folds are attracted to each other, and the, the upcoming pressure will force them open again, and you know, and uh, that creates voicing basically. So if there is an open transition, the linguistic default would be voicing. So this model would give us an account of schwa surfacing in an entirely voiceless world by using. The, the, the coordination of oral gestures and a prosodically triggered clock slowing mechanism. Um, interestingly here, um, you have basically a linear parameter that uh, accounts for the slowing down of the gestures and a categorical outcome, if, if there's, so that's not linear, at some point it tips and you get actually something categorically different from before. Okay, so this account explains why we have schwa, more schwa in phrase final position than in phrase medial position and it also accounts for the fact it gives us a model of a vocal tract configuration that facilitates vowel emergence in this case. Note that this particular vocal here is still, can still be considered a, just an artifact of biomechanics of the dynamics of speech articulation however interacting on different levels so local articulatory gestures are interacting with prosodically triggered clock slowing mechanisms. However, it's still not an element for the system and that is relevant to the system. So here is um, my argumentation for how this particular element could become part of the system. So imagine we have a communicatively relevant tonal movement um, which, and, and you have an utterance in which the, the material, the text, is not suitable to bear the tonal movement. We had that before, right? So then, remember back, I told you that tonal events are, private, uh, are quite variable in this language and they uh, have partic uh, uh, particular tendencies to be real realized on particular places. They can be realized, uh, that they want to be realized on more sonorous elements and they want to be realized uh, right most as possible. These two preferences here are in conflict with each other because if I want to put it on a sonorous element, on a vowel for example, I have to put it here, which is far away from the right edge. If I want to put it on the right edge, there is no element that can actually bear its own movement, right? But now I've argued that a particular configuration, a vowel could emerge, an, an acoustic element that is, that is periodic and sonorant enough to bear tonal movement, and it's close to the right edge. So this actually resolves this issue here, this conflict between those two preferences. And the tune actually notice that there is this element so the tune is realized on that element and now remember back what I said about the interaction of the tonal event and the segments that it's superimposed on I told you earlier that the syllable the tone is superimposed on is phonetically enhanced longer and louder so if the tonal event is realized on that bit of the text the text will, be, will become louder and longer right so how do we come from here to here? Well, we have a transitional vocal, just an artifact of biomechanics that is, however, visible to the tune. The tune, the, the necessity to realize a tonal event, will exploit this element to resolve conflicts with regard to tonal placement. And by doing so, it will phonetically enhance this element. So now we are in a situation in which we have a rather consistent element, consistent in terms of its position, which is loud, and long, pretty salient perceptual. And now we just need one small step towards phonage de vowel. We need a listener that reanalyzes this um, really consistent pattern as part of the system, as a, a prosodic marker or some kind of an emerging tone bearing unit that enables the tonal system to be realized. Um, so this is uh, my account of how something that is not existent, a stable state of not having any phonological element can actually have an evolutionary pathway via biomechanics towards being part of the phonological system. Bottom line here is that the tune drives the text. The necessity to realize tonal movement is forcing the system into a state in which a vowel emerges and might become part of the system. Right? Um, 
So that is the picture for Tishlid, and Tishlid is not um, unique with regard to this particular observation, but people haven't talked about it yet. So, for example, one interesting case is Japanese. Japanese has high vowel devoicing between voiceless consonants. However, this phonological rule is sometimes probabilistically suppressed when the vowel is supposed to carry a high tone or a pitch accent. So functionally relevant tone and movement that wants to be realized. And if um, the, the vowel is devoiced, it can't be realized. So the tune in Japanese drives actually blocking of a low level phonological rule to remain the, the, the text as suitable as possible to, for the tone to be realized. So, Overall, the idea of tune drives text is nothing new. No, no one has actually talked about it in, in, with regard to this particular framework. So, I argue that mechanic properties of gestural organization can facilitate vocal read emergence. That is interesting because it can facilitate vocal read emergence even in an entirely voiceless environment. However, already we have an intricate interaction between local articulatory gestures and higher level prosodic clock slowing mechanisms. This element does not have to be considered as any part of the system. However, I argue that by interacting with intonation, by, by functional pressure to realize tone movements, you um, create a situation, a situation in which this vocal weight is exploited by the tonal system and therefore get, gets phonetically enhanced and might be then um, salient enough to be reinterpreted by a listener as part of the system. So bottom line basically is the tune drives the text and um, that means that tune and text actually interact bidirectionally. That's what I uh, was, was, was pointing at at the beginning. So it's not just that the text can drive the tune, the tune can actually drive the text and it's more intricate than we thought it is. So coming back to the question I raised in the title, how does an intonation system accommodate to an adverse phonological environment. Well, I argue that the intonation system forces the environment um, to better itself. You know, that, so it forces the environment to to change. So it can actually be um, the tone can be um, realized. On that note, I want to end. And thank you. And I'm looking forward to hear what you think. <laughs>